Buenos días a todos. Good morning, Good morning everybody. Okay, we have more than 200 people. Tenemos más de 200 personas. Les quiero dar la bienvenida a todos. I would like to welcome you all to this webinar that we have developed together with IFBM and A and the webinar of uh, Reliance. We have in simultaneous interpretation, so please select your preferred language. You can find that at the bottom of your screen. Uh, here, this webinar, so you you can do it on your screen. Um, and here is um, here are the instructions for that. Aquí están las instrucciones para que cada uno lo pueda hacer en el idioma de su preferencia. Esta es la agenda que tenemos prevista para el día de hoy. Yo muy pronto le daré unas palabras. This is our de... agenda for today. I will give you some uh, welcoming remarks. And after that, we will give the floor to Janice, who is the director of the regulatory area of IFPMA. We will have Ludovico Samuel Paganini's uh, presentation too. I'm sorry. I don't know if I pronounced his name correctly. He's from Swiss Medic, and he's going to give us a very important presentation. After that, we have Jorge Azar, who's also going to be with us, giving us uh, a lot of additional knowledge for all of us here today. I, can, I am pleased to see that we have almost 300 people logged in. And after that, we have a guided panel and then the closing remarks by Diego Salas, the Regulatory Affairs Director. We're really very pleased to, to be a, to have been able to uh, set up this webinar. We think it's going to be a very significant approach. So without further ado, I'm going to give you my welcoming remarks for this event. As I said, we were all very excited to be here today launching what we have uh, called our our Reliance Month. It is a pleasure to me for all of us who work in Fee Pharma. I want to thank Diego Salas from the bottom of a heart and also Janice and Sergio for having organized, for having put together this uh, joint event. For the first time in Fee Pharma, we have decided to create this initiative that we have called the Reliance Month. And as I said, it's starting with this month that we are having today, this webinar. Reliance Month's objective is to share relevant information and success stories that can be used as an example to continue to promote reliance in the region. So we have a lot of wonderful speakers today. We are very, very proud to have uh, created so many partnerships with so many organizations, especially with IFPMA for this event. IFPMA and Fepharma, we work for the patients and to find solutions that will allow us to move to more sustainable healthcare ecosystems and in the Fepharma case for the Latin American region. I always like to say that uh, Fepharma's uh, bet goes through three big topics. And I always say this because uh, I feel that is our biggest contribution to the region and to our the focus of our work, what we do every day. The first thing is connect. FIFARMA always likes to be connecting. We connect with the best practices, with the experts, with the organizations. And today, I think this webinar is a reflection of what we feel that we need to always do, which is connect. The second thing that which is like the, like the stamp that FIFARMA has is have a view based on data with a regional perspective. That's why we do a lot of studies, generate data, connect with people, organizations that can give us studies that will contribute to the discussion and that will contribute in that big effort that we all have to continue to improve and have more and more health care for our patients. And the third one, what I always insist on, I don't get tired of saying this is to promote articulated work. The solution for the problems in the region can only happen that this is only going to be possible if we work together, if we work in an articulated fashion. Today, we're here for an essential topic that has to do with the importance of having 
competent regulatory system, having systems, having high standards of the sanitary agencies that helps increase efficiency of the healthcare services and facilitate a trade among the countries. And of course, to back uh, the uh, economic growth to contribute to the uh, social progress. In Fifarma, we have a strong commitment. We work on that uh, energetically every day, and we have a very robust work team through which we are always available to support the healthcare systems and the regulatory agencies to adopt uh, the approaches that will allow them to move forward and get higher and higher standards. Oh, hopefully the best international standard. IFPMA and Pharma and all of us here know that a solid regulatory uh, system is not an easy job, but if we work together, something I always insist on, my industry, regulators, the civil society, we can move forward to strengthen regulatory systems that are aligned to international practices. And I am also very pleased to know that we're going to be able to hear Swiss Medica about practical experiences, tools and case of studies that represent innovative um, approaches. So the objective of this uh, it will be to think about how we can apply this. I am thanking everybody here. We have 357 people and counting. And that's why I love to see that we have a possibility to uh, bring together so many people that we are all interested in moving forward. We all, you are all welcome. And now I'm gonna give the floor to Janice Bernal of EFBMA so that she can give us her welcoming remarks. Thank you, Yanis, and I'm very excited and, and happy to uh, be here today um, on behalf of IFPMA and, and really happy to support um, the Reliance Month that Fee Pharma is supporting. I really think it's a, a great initiative. Perhaps we could just go ahead and, and move to the next slide. And I think today what I would really like to do is kind of set the scene for you. This is a discussion around regulatory reliance. So I think it's a good opportunity to review and put into perspective um, the various parameters, uh, the various levels of regulatory reliance that can be used. We could have the next slide, please. So this is an image taken from the World Health Organization's uh, Good Reliance Practices. And this really shows you the spectrum of reliance that is out there today and is actually being practiced by the different national regulatory authorities. And you can see the, the, the yellow arrow on the left-hand side is looking as you go up, you improve efficiency of the regulatory system. And then on the right hand side with the big blue area arrow, you're really looking at building more and more trust uh, between national regulatory authorities. I think it's good to step back and actually look at what is the definition for reliance? What is the definition that the World Health Organization has put to reliance? And really it's very, it's quite simple. It's, it's basically where one national regulatory authority in one jurisdiction takes into account and gives significant weight to an assessment performed by another national regulatory authority. And the relying authority remains independent, responsible, and accountable regarding the decisions taken. And I think that's an important thing to remember. When you implement reliance as a national regulatory authority, you do not lose your sovereignty. You still have the opportunity to make your own decisions. As you can see from this, this image, reliance is actually a, quite a broad term when it comes to practice, and it can mean different things to different groups. Uh, work sharing, if you look on the left-hand side, for example, is a form of reliance and in many cases might be easier to implement as a framework for national regulatory authorities who are still experimenting with the concept of reliance. And the idea is that by working together, national regulatory authorities can build the trust that's needed for more significant forms of reliance, such as abridged pathways. 
So if you move to the next step in the middle of the image, you're looking at abridged pathways or verification, which is really looking and taking into account assessment reports or documents from a reference authority and applying them to reliance and seeing how they can be used in different areas. And this can apply to quality control testing, GXP inspection, dossier, and all the way up to approval. And then if you move further along uh, the image, you can see there are can be regional reliance mechanisms amongst a group of countries, which could be an centralized evaluation, and then all the way up to unilateral or mutual recognition. This can be based on treaties, and we do have some examples in real life where there are some uh, mutual recognition agreements, uh, specifically with uh, GMP inspections between the US, uh, FDA, and the EMA, just as an example. And I think reliance really gets to the, the crux of the matter that you know, regulatory systems are an essential part of health system strengthening. The World Health Assembly in 2014 passed a resolution talking about how uh, health systems, specifically uh, regulatory approval systems, are really at the heart of ensuring that medicines and vaccines get to patients and then that as these national regulatory authorities grow and develop, uh, regulations become more harmonized over time and standards and scientific uh, principles that are harmonized then allow for further initiatives around work sharing and joint uh, assessments as well. And I would encourage you uh, to take a look at the World Health Organization's Good Reliance practices, guidance that's available, because it really provides a guide on how reliance can be implemented with national regulatory authorities for medicines, vaccines, blood and blood products, medical devices, and how reliance can be utilized across the full life cycle of a medical product. And this is also defined in the World Health Organization's global benchmarking tool, and they've broken down the life cycle of a medical product into several areas, including registration and marketing authorization, vigilance, market surveillance and control, licensing establishments, regulatory inspection, laboratory testing, clinical trial oversight, and NRA lot release. So again, as I just mentioned, encourage everybody to take a look at that to really understand how reliance can be um, impactful in, in your area, but also impactful in regulatory system strengthening. Next slide, please. So just to cover, uh, what are the advantages of, of reliance? And, and reliance, you know, I think is not just for the industry. It's not just for the industry to encourage national regulatory authorities to use reliance in order to move marketing authorization more quickly, but it has benefits for many groups of people, uh, including patients and healthcare providers, the regulatory agencies themselves, and manufacturers. From a manufacturer point of view, it really streamlines regulatory submissions and helps to ensure that global supply systems are predictable and there are timely approvals for uh, new drugs, new medicines, and vaccines. For regulatory agencies, we see reliance as an opportunity to work smarter and not harder and really look at efficient utilization of resources an opportunity to reduce duplication in activities between national regulatory agencies, as well as an opportunity to maintain the sovereignty over the decision-making. But most importantly, it's an opportunity to improve and increase timely access to safe, effective, and quality medical products for patients. At the end of the day, that's why we're here. And I think that's why it's really important uh, that all of us look at how reliance uh, can be utilized and how we can ensure that it, it's impactful moving forward because reliance can be used also in ensuring that novel treatments and novel medicines also have an opportunity to reach the most countries. Next slide, please. And just to, to wrap up a little bit, um, there are other opportunities um, with reliance. 
as mentioned previously, um, when national regulatory authorities work together, um, they build trust together. It's an opportunity for regulatory convergence, which hopefully will then lead to harmonization. And when uh, national regulatory authorities are working to the same guidance, to the same regulations, then this can really in, uh, facilitate the implementation of regulatory reliance. And we really uh, do look that, and hope that in some cases that there are changes to regulatory and legal frameworks that actually aim to leverage the benefits of regulatory reliance. Again, on that trust, you strengthen trust between stakeholders, additional collaboration and dialogue certainly helps to create and build trust, which is the foundation for regulatory reliance. And finally, looking at capacity building, this is also an opportunity when you have national regulatory authorities working together, there's an opportunity for learning and experience sharing. And also that links into uh, the industry as well. When industry applies and pilots and uses these reliance procedures, there's a good opportunity um, for dialogue and best practices and learning. So I would just like to close today and uh, say thank you. Next slide, please. And wish you um, all the best in the discussions because I think this is going to be very fruitful and I am looking forward to uh, the following agenda. Thank you so much. Agradecemos muchísimo a Janice Bernat, directora de Asuntos Científicos. Thank you, Janice, uh, the director of regulatory uh, affairs uh, for being here with us and for giving the initial elements for this conversation. Now we're going to welcome our next panelist as the National Regulatory Agency, Mr. Ludovico Paganini, who is the scientific officer of uh, stakeholder engagement in Swiss Medic, the Swiss Agency for Therapeutic Products with the uh, talk Reliance and Shared Work. Ludovico, thank you for being a part of this relevant activity. You can start sharing your screen and your talk. <clears throat> All uh, representatives uh, of the Pharma and uh, IFPMA for having Swiss Medic here today uh, and for having me presenting you, uh, giving you an overview of uh, what we do in terms of uh, collaboration, reliance and work sharing. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Janice, for setting uh, the scene so, so, so well that I will make reference to a lot of uh, the elements that you've mentioned. And show you a little bit in detail or uh, with, with concrete examples what we do at Swiss Medic in terms of implementing reliance. So I hope that you are able to see my slides in full screen modus. So I will just go ahead and share with you the outline of my presentation. Great. Um, so I will start with uh, um, some principles or, or an overview of uh, what we do in terms of international collaboration. Uh, then I will uh, go into uh, some details regarding reliance and work sharing, what we do as Swiss Medic, both in terms of reliance as applied by Swiss Medic, but also reliance on Swiss Medic decisions. Um, and then as a third uh, uh, topic, I will talk about our activities uh, within the regulatory system strengthening um, engagement. And um, so let me start with some principles of what we um, want to interpret our collaboration on the on the global scale. Um, so we, we think that um, it always needs to be a targeted approach. What we do um, needs to be based on a, on a strategy so uh, that we go into the different um, uh, fields and in different organizations and, and activities with a clear intention of why we are doing what uh, and, and with the goal uh, clearly set in mind. Um, we focus our collaboration at level of organizations and associations, so we rarely um, um, go into bilateral uh, collaboration with, with, uh, with, with um, 
specific uh, companies or even uh, also other agency. So, so we tend to, um, or we've sh shifted our focus now on to the um, global international convergence, harmonization and collaboration. Uh, but we do still have uh, bilateral uh, collaboration and I will talk about uh, that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, we also try to care for an open and transparent communication, try to balance both passive and active communication. Uh, and we think that um, our cooperation, what we do in that uh, field needs to create and maintain trust at all time. And uh, we, we have to make sure to create a mutual understanding when we go um, into collaboration at any level. So uh, I think uh, as a, a, um, a key element here, uh, um, it's important to have in mind that we have to do something to, to address the increasing uh, resources that, it, that are needed. So um, collaboration, reliance, we're sharing these, these are all elements, aspects that need us, uh, that help us uh, to, to reduce resources and to be as efficient as possible. And, um, what we also do uh, is we apply a risk-based approach that is what I've uh, mentioned in the beginning with, uh, with uh, having a clear strategy in mind. So we, um, we focus and align our collaboration uh, based on, on a risk-based approach where we need to focus our resources on, uh, where we can, um, let's say, set back a little bit and, and rely on other decisions or rely on work sharing, then we do that. So it's, it's always with that mindset um, that, we, that we do our work. So in terms of um, international collaboration and multilateral collaboration, this is just um, a non-exhaustive list of the organizations and, and uh, uh, activities that we are engaged with on a, an international um, level. So you see ICMRA, ICH, IPRP, the, the PIC scheme for, uh, for GMP and inspections, IMDRF for medical devices, which is increasingly um, uh, of increased importance for us. And then uh, in the, at the bottom, you see um, our let's say work sharing and, and reliance um, activities with the Access Consortium, Project Orbis, uh, and, and the one at the bottom uh, right should be a, a representation of our um, regulatory system strengthening uh, engagement and more particularly our procedure for marketing authorization um, of global health products, which I will talk about um, at the end of my presentation. In terms of uh, bilateral collaboration, as I've mentioned, we, we do have uh, um, this collaboration with, with partner authorities. Here is a list of all the, the agreements that we've uh, established over the years with, with our partner authorities. Uh, you can see that uh, focusing on the uh, Latin American region, we have uh, two partner authorities with which we've uh, concluded a, an agreement. That's the both the authorities in Me Mexico and Brazil. And uh, you see all the others uh, all over the world. But as I've mentioned before, our focus uh, at the moment is not on uh, having the most bilateral agreements or MOUs, uh, memorandum of understandings, or uh, even uh, mutual recognition agreements uh, with the most possible uh, authorities rather we we tend to focus more on the international collaboration convergence harmonization so i think uh, i can just skip this slide uh, janice already gave you uh, the definition for reliance uh, which is the same that you find here and also what we in what we what, what we understand under work sharing So in terms of reliance uh, and in terms of really um, relying on 
assessments done by other agencies. We have an own article in our legislation, which is Article 13 of the Therapeutic Products Act, which clearly states or gives us the framework for us to be able to, to rely on, on these decisions. And you can see here that um, we do so when an authorization is uh, granted in a country with a comparable control system for medicinal products. And there is a list actually linked here um, at the bottom of the slides. Uh, this, all this information you'll find on, on, uh, on our website. And the list is uh, of all the countries that we, um, that we think um, have a comparable human medicinal product control. Um, then looking at the scope for, for us to be able to rely and to make use of this uh, Article 13, well, first of all, um, it all depends on an applicant request. So uh, it's the applicant that needs to make reference to this Article 13 and inform us that they would like to, uh, they would like us to rely on decisions made by other authorities based on this article. And the scope is is basically for um uh, for a lot of uh, uh, types of products for new authorization uh, applications for medicinal products with known active substances, also for new authorizations for biosimilars. Uh, also um, in additional indications and um, applications for extensions and variations. Now I'll move on to the understanding of reliance on Swiss medic um, decisions. And I make reference here to the to the Swiss Medics WLA uh, status, to the w, uh, WHO listed authority status, which is um, uh, the new framework that has been set up by WHO to, to have a really evidence-based way to recognize reference uh, authorities um, globally. Uh, and Swiss Medic, together with, uh, with the agencies in Singapore and, uh, and South Korea, uh, have been the three pilot uh, authorities to undergo this this assessment, which is uh, to some extent similar to the WHO benchmarking assessment that um, Janice has, has mentioned before, but goes a little bit further, uh, of course, um, to really make sure that the authorities that undergo this special uh, performance um, assessment, they that they uh, can be um, can be regarded as listed authorities at WHO as reference uh, authorities. Uh, here you can see some of the implications of Swiss Medic reaching this status. So uh, WLA um, enables to uh, make use efficiently make use of regulatory resources because. It, it gives a clear, transparent, evidence-based uh, framework for other uh, authorities to promote um, to to promote trust, confidence, and reliance. It encourages continuous improvement because um, as as soon as you've reached this status, you cannot just stop. You cannot relax and sit back. But it's it's a way to to also show that the agency is on a constant improvement path. And wants to to always be um, uh, on top of regulatory um, regulatory uh, convergence and collaboration. It also helps procurement decisions. This is more uh, of a, an implication that is um, regarding um, UN organizations, but still, it's also um, a clear manifest for them to be able to rely. Um, on a well-informed base on, on, on decisions made by the reference authorities. And it also contributes to the WHO pre-qualification program uh, because it expands the pool of trusted regulatory authorities for, uh, for the colleagues at WHO. And lastly, um, it also fosters health quality equity because it, it, it's, it's an, it, it enables uh, an environment of innovation 
for, for local production and uh, for accelerating access to medical products. Uh, now we move on to, um, to the work sharing bit of our activities and as a um, showcase, uh, uh, I will be presenting you the uh, Access Consortium, which is this uh, work sharing initiative that we carry out together with the Therapeutic Goods Administration in uh, Australia, with Health Canada, with the Health Science Authority in Singapore. Um, and since um, I think two years now, uh, also with the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency in the UK. So this is a um, really well-established mechanism or initiative uh, to collaborate and to do work sharing amongst uh, agencies. You can see here all the fields um, that um, and all the working groups that are involved in, in this collaboration. We have a working group for biosimilars, for clinical trials, for generic medicines, even for IT um, issues and questions. We have one for new active substances. We've uh, established one also during the pandemic. And have, uh, we have also a dedicated ICH working group. And on this slide, you, you, you see on a really simple um, manner what is uh, or how it's working, how does this uh, work sharing initiative work. So basically, also in this case, upon request by an applicant to, to make use of this work sharing initiative, the work, the assessment work is, is uh, divided into, um, uh, into different um, uh, types of uh, assessment and assigned to to, um, to the agencies that are participating. So you'll see one agency will be dealing with the quality assessment, one with the non-clinical assessment, and another with the clinical assessment. And at the end, when all these authorities have done their assessment, they're part of the assessment, the assessment gets consolidated and put into one um, single consolidated assessment. But in the end, even in this case, when we do work sharing, the decision is still our. So it's a sovereign decision that each of the agencies can make uh, independently. It's just a way to make our work easier, to, to share uh, the, the burden, so to say, uh, to share the work and to come to a, to a common conclusion. Now, um, I will move on to uh, and talk about the, the regular, regulatory system strengthening activities that we that we implement at Swiss Medic. And uh, what you see here on the slide is a visualization of the overall Swiss approach to um, improving access to to medicines. It is all based on on a on a Swiss health foreign policy uh, that is called. It's uh, it's the really consolidated policy uh, which uh, all the different departments and uh, offices within the federal government in Switzerland have reducted, have worked on together to come up with a um, with a common understanding of how Switzerland wants to uh, promote. Um, uh, health uh, and and access to uh, medicinal products, um, not just in, not only in Switzerland but uh, also um, uh, all over the world. Uh, this um, this flow, uh, uh, these elements that you see on the right hand side, they relate to the to one of the main action uh, fields um, or the more fields of action that uh, are set in, in this uh, uh, Swiss health foreign policy. Uh, and this is uh, how we understand our approach to access to, to, to improving access to medicinal products. And it goes on, uh, it starts with the uh, research and development. It goes on with the uh, regulatory systems, which is what's, um, uh, where Swiss Medic is interested. Then financing, financing supply and distribution 
distribution, healthcare facilities, equipment, and personnel, all the way up to the, to the patients. Uh, now, of course, I will be focusing more on the regulatory system, um, strengthening BIT, uh, and show you some of the activities that we've implemented over the last um, six, um, seven years. So we have one, um, one element which, uh, which is harmonization, and we support especially to, to the implementation of the African Medicines Regulatory Harmonization, which is a continental initiative led by the, by the African Union Development Agency, and where WHO is also heavily uh, involved. And it's basically a way to, to promote uh, convergence and reliance and collaboration on the African continent. And this um, is set up on different levels geographically. It starts with the support to the different uh, national regulatory authorities. It goes on on the re uh, regional level where different regions in Africa have their own um, harmonization initiatives, have their own also joint assessment um, uh, procedures where they collaborate. They uh, also do um, collaborative um, um, assessments. And then the ultimate um, level, the, the last level is the continental one where we have different working groups uh, that uh, focus on different uh, uh, regulatory functions and where Swiss Medic helps uh, together with a big set of, um, of partners. And all of this work within the MRH should then at some point lead to the operationalization of the African Medicines Agency, which will be a huge step for the African continent uh, in terms of, uh, of, of faster access to really important medical products in terms of uh, reliance and convergence. Then the second, um, let's say, uh, area of work that we do within the regulatory system strengthening is um, on access and reliance. And uh, also in this, um, in, this, in this case, we've uh, implemented a way to promote, to foster reliance on Swiss Medic's decision. Uh, this is the Swiss Medic procedure for um, marketing authorization for global health products. And it's, uh, I will go into the details uh, later on, but it's, it's um, also a way to, on one side, build trust into the Swiss Medic uh, way of working into our processes. Uh, and it's uh, also a way to, um, to get a faster access to medicinal products in, in distinct in specific regions and countries. And then the last bit is our capacity building activities, um, trainings, uh, and so on that we that we've developed. We have uh, um, uh, a few examples that I will show you uh, on one of the last slides. And all of these activities um, they are funded from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which uh, with which we've now uh, just. A couple of weeks ago, signed a, a new agreement for us to be able to work on these uh, activities for another three years. Um, what I uh, also wanted to mention is the coalition of interested parties, because in the field of um, regulatory system strengthening and collaboration within that framework, I think it's really a huge step for um, different various partners uh, organizations, uh, regulatory agencies, but also NGOs and philanthropic organizations to come together and to try to, to be efficient in the way they, they use the resources to support other initiatives or countries or, um, or, or regulatory system strengthening in general. So you see we have... Um, um, now six uh, regions, 40 countries that are being supported, over 350 activities and a budget of um, um, 
45 million US dollars. But this, uh, these are figures from last year, so it might even be um, higher figures by now. And the idea here is really to prom promote a unified strategic and coordinated approach to regulatory system strengthening and to enhance, uh, enhance and to improve uh, access to safe, effective and quality medical products. But to do that in a way that we do not duplicate resources, um, that we um, are as efficient as possible in supporting other countries and regions in strengthening their systems. Now, uh, regarding, regarding the marketing authorization for global health products, um, the idea here is that we build on our standard assessment procedure. The milestones are almost exactly identical, with the only difference being that we involve other uh, assessors from NRAs and also WHO, uh, if the applicants request to have also WHO uh, experts on board. Uh, and we involve them into our own assessment procedures. We give um, experts and assessors from uh, foreign, uh, from, from other NRAs, the opportunity to provide input. First of all, they get access to all of the documentation as Swiss Medic receives it from, from, the, from the applicant. And then they have the opportunity to provide input to the assessment reports, to, to um, to participate in all of the internal meetings uh, that are um, taking place within Swiss Medic and to be a part essentially uh, of the extended um, case team that is working on a, on a, a specific dose. Yeah. So there are really um, almost a, an additional uh, community to, to the Swiss Medic uh, team that is um, doing the assessment. Um, and here I've, I've listed some of the uh, benefits that we've identified uh, if, if the MAGHP is applied and um, made use uh, made use of by by the by the industry. So we think it 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 helps building trust and confidence in the process in terms of um, other regulatory authorities being able to have a look into the Swiss Medic work. It helps building, uh, building capacity because these experts can also um, closely watch how we or, or see how Swiss Medic um, uh, draws uh, an assessment, how it's structured, what, what are the key elements to, to look at. So it's uh, also some sort of uh, training for, for the assessors. But um, what is in the end even most most important is that it facilitates and, and speeds up the, the national uh, decision um, regarding a specific product. So in, in the end, it's not just um, a form of relying on a decision without knowing what, what, uh, why this, this decision has been made, but it's a well-informed form of reliance because um, you do not only have access to the assessment reports, but you've also had the opportunity to see how they've been produced, what um, elements have been looked at, uh, what, the, what the key um, issues were during the assessment and so on. And um, also it results in a, ideally it results in a Swiss marketing authorization. So uh, it has a, also a direct impact uh, in terms of um, um, authorizations. And it has no restrictions to specific indications. So all types of products are um, essentially um, eligible for, for, um, for the MAGHP. But what we look at is that um, these products, they should have an impact um, on a on a existing medical need, so we look at uh, products that might be potentially life saving in countries where a specific um, uh, disease um, is endemic, so that we we can also uh, really support 
products that that have um, a high uh, medical need. And uh, here on this slide is is a case study from one of these um, assessments that, that that we've done within the MHHP. It's a product for prevention of postpartum uterine atony, where we had, uh, um, I think we had eight NRAs involved, uh, seven of which have granted authorization based on the work, work that has been done um, in the procedure. Three of these um, have done, have made a decision uh, within less than 90 days. Uh, and it also, has been used by WHO through their own collaborative registration procedure to to foster additional uh, additional um, authorizations in in other countries. And what I also wanted to mention here is um, based on this um, assessment, made based on the MAGHP pr procedure, this product also received positive recommendation by by the Carpass, Carpass by the Caribbean regulatory system, and it's also received a WHO prequalification. Uh, additionally, to to this case study, we also had um, uh, now it's it's even more than four scientific advices. Uh, we had um, many advocacy events on the MAG, MAGHP to really sensitize the industry and also other NRAs. Um, on what the MHHP is, what it does, and what the goal of it is. And the idea here is also to continuously improve the procedure because we start as a, started as a pilot, but we knew that the procedure needed to be tweaked and, and adjusted uh, to really meet the needs of both the industry and NRAs. So our goal is to continuously improve and change the, the procedure, not change radically but change but in terms of adapting and, and improving the the procedure then um, I'll talk I quickly also mentioned the regulatory training courses which um, have been established uh, in back in 2018 18 uh, as a pilot pro uh, project and we now have this training um, every um, all every year, twice a year. So we had, um, in my modest opinion, uh, a, quite a great impact, both in terms of numbers, as you can see, we had uh, over 335 trained attendees from over 60, 68 countries, but also in terms of impact because we've uh, we didn't want just this training just to be another of the activities that we do we wanted really also to measure the impact and so we did together with WHO we've published a study that really showed that uh, the the participants in these trainings were also able to take home key messages that they wanted to implement in their own agencies and they they were able to do so and this agency See, also went on and uh, uh, tried to to implement these um, uh, these elements. So, in this study, we did um, interviews with, uh, with the participants, of course, but also with their direct managers to really see if uh, we we were able to go one step further and 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 foster change into the other NRAs into the NRAs that that have participated and. What I also highlighted here are uh, the participations from from the uh, Latin American region and Central America. Uh, we um, have participants or had participants from Bolivia, from uh, Carpa, from uh, Pajo, also from Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Panama, and Peru. So. Um, this is a training that uh, is um, targeting NRAs all over the world. There is no restriction, um, but um, attendance is based on the on the needs, on the concrete needs that each NRAs have. So, the decision about participation is 
It's not made by Swiss medic. We are not competent for knowing who's um, most in need. Um, that's up to the WHO. So it's the World Health Organization who uh, guides us in terms of um, invitation uh, and participation of NRAs. And I will just conclude with some considerations. Um, I think um, it's, it should be clear that the cooperation is paramount. It, it's really, it's not just important. I think even more in, in the globalized environment, it, it's, it's really key to, um, for NRAs to be able to function because no one single NRA is able to, to, um, to do all the tasks, to reach all the goals, to do everything. So we need to have uh, cooperation. And I think what is also clear is that there is the need for a, really for a, a, a basis of trust between regulators and confidence in regulatory systems for us to be able to move on to the next step, to have common standards, to have harmonized requirements, to have convergence, and then from there to go on and, uh, and, and, and uh, let's say um, move move on uh, on the ladder of reliance that Janice has, has uh, showed before. And I think what um, also is uh, is needed are clear objectives and criteria. So we have to to analyze which tasks need to be performed uh, locally. So where we need to build capacity internally. Uh, uh, whereas other tasks can be relied upon um, by the work uh, on the work done by other regulators. So we have to build trust in other regulators. Uh, but ultimately, the, that's um, as the Swiss medic take, there is no um, one size fits all. So there is always the need for a tailored approach in each type of collaboration and, and um, cooperation. And there is also the need for a balanced approach towards work sharing, reliance. It, it always needs to be a, a give and take and with a, a clear um, last objective in mind, which is to, to be as sufficient as possible in terms for us to be able to provide safe, um, efficacious and good quality medicines to our patients. So with that, I've... Uh, concluded my my presentation and I'm looking forward to to the next presentation thank you agradecemos muchísimo la participación de Ludovico Paganini thank you so much Ludovico Paganini uh, representing Swiss Medic the Swiss agency for therapeutic products showing us how the different reliance mechanisms such as joint work can be adopted by any regulatory authority, ir irrespective of its level. Uh, we will continue with our agenda, and further down the process, we will ask you to join our panel, Ludovico. Uh, questions for our panelists can be added in our questions and answers uh, a chat session. We will try to address these questions during the panel and in writing. I now welcome our last presenter, Mr. Jorge Azar, Senior Director of Regulatory Affairs in Latin America for AstraZeneca, who is today representing the Reliance Working Group of IFPMA. His presentation is called Tools to Facilitate Reliance, the Use of Reliance. Jorge, welcome. If you will please share your screen. Thank you, Diego. Can you see my screen? Please confirm. I'm going to put it in a presentation mode. Perfecto, Jorge. Great, Jorge. Thank you. Well, moving on with this great opportunity we have today, I want to thank you on behalf of IF. EMA for this invitation. I'm going to share with you two tools that are very important when implementing reliance and when 
continuing to optimize reliance process in our region. These two tools are how can we ensure that the product is similar to the one that was approved by the reference agency or what we call product sameness and also the effective use of assessment reports issued by the reference authority to for for reliance purposes so moving on with our presentation i want to show you a map of our current situation where we are have implemented reliance globally where we view that it has been positively progressing and the different scopes that we have on reliance such as the unilateral you know, and the collaboration model and the and whose purpose is to achieve the fast approval of a product and guarantee equitable access around the world we also can see how if we see how latin america is progressing we see it's going positively and we believe there is an important opportunity to continue implementing uh, improvements and reliance in the region for the benefit of our patients now why is reliance important i believe that based on what we've already seen and with our uh, panelists and Daniel Rico, applying reliance is increasingly important in the, in the in the for the fast development of the product and because of the need to achieve uh, fast access for the patients, particularly in countries where there are any medical and met needs. And um, very importantly, the regulatory authority that implements reliance is responsible, is autonomous for its own, own decisions, and that is not going to change. And while we find this effective way of using resources to uh, assess our products, and also, as we have mentioned, the WHO supports uh, these pathways or these channels to accelerate the availability of new medications around the globe. Now, when we're talking about product sameness or when we talk about a product that is similar to the one that was approved, the regulatory authority that will be reviewing this uh, product must assess whether it's the same one that uh, was reviewed in the country of reference. And here we could consider the guide of the WHO where they say what the parameters are that should be considered. And uh, here, just to mention some, it must uh, it must meet the same quantitative, uh, qualitative formula, same concentration, same pharmaceutical formula, and the same have the same quality of the ingredients in such a way that these products that have generally been uh, assessed by the regulator also uh, follow international standards established by the ICH that allow to ensure that the same quality attributes exist and that the product will be the same that will be distributed around the globe. Now, talking to about how to associate the product sameness to the contents of the dossier and the chain of manufacture of the product, a very important point here is that when we talk about same product, we don't necessarily need to submit the same dossier and they are not necessarily the same manufacturing sites. If we take this in detail, what we need to comply with in the dossier, we first need to take into account what is established by the local jurisdiction. And very importantly, we need to highlight the, the differences that are some of the variations that we have for the product and which are a part of the streamlining process for this formulation and which we can transparently indicate what these changes are 
while maintaining the, the, the quality of the product. And this not necessarily limits the use of reliance. The reliance opportunity stays there uh, while we see the transparency. In a new application, we will be able to see these differences in the dossier, maybe because in the countries it is subject, submitted for approval by the uh, health authority, but there's a possibility that through uh, evaluation reports or assessment reports, we might be uh, become aware of what the details that were assessed by the reference authority were and what the questions and answers were so that we have a comprehensive view of what the areas considered were in making the final decision. I mean, for, for, for this new authority that we're su submitting for approval to. Um, at the manufacturing level, it's worth highlighting that under the, the, the demands that we have now and the fact that it's important to guarantee continuity of treatment, it is necessary to have more than one, one manufacturing location. And the most important thing here is that all these manufacturing sites will operate in the same quality standards that are internationally established through the ICH. And in the event of variations, it should be thoroughly assessed and comprehensively assessed and uh, to establish what the aspects where the quality is maintained are. So it's also important to make progress in that at the approval level, we also need to implement reliance for post-approval uh, changes or variations, understanding that there are mechanisms to get the information through evaluation and through a history of the product, which is the annual report. And to give you some more details on this area, I want to invite you to a webinar that we're going to have on May the 23rd to talk a little bit more about these aspects. Some other additional points to take into account on where we can continue building this trust, or how can we build a much more efficient process to ensure that the product has sameness vis-a-vis uh, -vis the one that was submitted to the health authority. We believe that we need to continue developing this trust with the authorities that are reviewing this new submitted product. And transparency is key along with the, the company that is applying for registration. And I want to highlight to some points. It's important to highlight these differences that will be critical and that justify that despite these differences, there is no impact in the security, safety, or efficacy of the product. On the other hand, we need to find areas to have detailed discussions about the ICH established guides. And we are also ready to collaborate, to share uh, the experience of other health authorities and further discuss what have been some of these cases where we have been able to implement reliance and what opportunities for improvement are there to continue advancing and implementation in the countries and improving in the, all of it. As Ludovico mentioned, we need to continue fostering a search for harmonization and uh, then trying to continue to find convergence and perhaps look at what the uh, WHO has established as a way to start building this platform. On the other hand, I want to invite you to review the document from IFPMA that contains all the relevant points uh, when, take, when considering whether there is a product sameness in a product in order to implement reliance. And quite in line with that, I have uh, EMA posted last month a form that can be used as a guide. It's an optional format. The applicant can, it, it can include together with the dossier that they're going to submit for registration. 
and we can review the document that is being uh, submitted. And if there are any discrepancies that need to be highlighted before the health authorities or justified from a safety, efficacy, and quality standpoint, we also do it. We think that this can be a, a starting point that uses many benefits because first, it will simplify the procedure. It will allow us to to harmonize and it definitely increases transparency and it provides a guide to truly focus on what the areas were that need to be revised or what is uh, the topics that need to be revised where so that we can make progress in the expedited evaluation or assessment and the review of the pro of the product and of course it reduces the, the number of documents that need to be looked at or it avoids uh, some duplicity during accountability here uh, I, i'm going to show you the the example of this form which i invite you to to check in more detail and it clearly describes what the uh, requirements are as per the ctd and where we have an opportunity to confirm or to to the, the, the document that we're submitting is the same as the reference document and if it is different we need to provide reasons why we believe the quality is maintained despite the changes and uh, and start seeing where we could continue to do uh, reliance and facilitate this discussion during the dossier review now as to the effective use of the evaluators report or the assessment report assessment reports detail and explain what the areas of safety efficacy and quality were that were assessed by the uh, health authority and for this i want to tell you that there are two types of reports um, regarding the product that is being assessed a report of the first uh, application as a new product is uh, issued but there are also reports on changes that are considered major changes so for instance a new pharmaceutical uh, formula and this can be made uh, public according to the guidelines established by the reference authority and we also have ones that are not drafted but could also be available if needed on the other hand we also have uh, the reports that are issued by the inspector at the manufacturing side and where they guarantee that the product adheres to good manufacturing practices established internationally and that it is uh, all done on site through a manufacturing site visit or it can also be online and depending on the established process it can also it can be done by the local authority or by the region as a validation of this manufacturing site as per the good manufacturing practices or standards that have been established as an important point let's say that to this day the assessment reports available don't follow a standard report that is not established yet however it does provide comprehensive information on all the things that were assessed and it provides all the transparency needed to check what the areas where the health authority uh, made their decision and um, these reports are created through data that uh, is sent by the company that developed the product and so they have all the necessary information to be able to uh, to review that as to how we can use these assessment reports we recognize at ifpma that there can be variations 
on how we can use them. But one of the proposed routes is to first look at the possibility of sharing the assessment report that is publicly available for this. It is not necessary to, to have a bilateral agreement and the assessment report is publicly available. If this public this is not publicly available, we can find ways to establish a bilateral agreement with the reference agency and the assessing agency and thus ensure that this is the most effective and safe way. And if if we don't have a, an NDA, we can have an alternative route of asking the company that is applying uh, directly asking it for the available report so that it is sent to the health authority allowing the assessment of the product as, as, as required. Regarding conditions and considerations and additional recommendations for the use of assessment reports, I would like to conclude here saying that it's important to continue looking for channels to strengthen reliance procedures, recognizing that at the moment of implementing this assessment report, it changes and recommend um, or promote the use of it. We also believe that this will significantly contribute to accelerating or expediting a review and the making of a more expedited decision for our patients. And um, I also would like to recommend adhering to one single assessment report at the moment of doing the initial application. So we request the assessment report for the country of reference to avoid duplicity and uh, dual reviews of decisions that have been made by other authorities. We suggest uh, using the one that was made under the local jurisdiction to determine and or, or for a specific country of reference. With this, I, I have finished my presentation. I hope that it was uh, informational to you and I invite you to continue walking steps of improvement for our patients in the Latin America region in terms of finding new products available in our region. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jorge, with your, for your presentation and such a relevant intervention in representation of the IAPMA Working Group. I extend an invitation to remain online because we are now moving on to the last session of this webinar, which is a guided panel, uh, which will be moderated by my colleague, Sergio Cavalero, Head of Regulatory Affairs for IFPMA, who we warmly welcome and thank you for your support in organizing this activity and also in other reliance activities at the global level, as well as in the LATAM region. Sergio, you can proceed and thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I'm just having an issue with my camera, but there we go. I'll try to put my virtual background again. All right. So thank you so much for all these great presentations. Um, I also see that we have a lot of questions already in the Q&A tool that participants can use to ask questions. So if possible, I think it would be great for uh, Tony, Jorge, and Ludovico to try and answer some of those. Uh, I know that particularly for Ludovico, his presentation was quite extensive and it covered the whole lot of uh, procedures and activities from Swiss Medic. So I guess for some of those details, uh, we would need to reach out to other parts in Swiss Medic to have the answers, but uh, it would be great to, to have your feedback on some of those questions as well, Ludovico. So now as we move to the, to the panel session, um, maybe I would start with uh, Tony, as we've heard already from Ludovico, who talked uh, to us a bit about what uh, Swiss Medic does and also how Swiss Medic is involved in international activities. 
we heard the international perspective from IFPMA. So maybe, uh, Tony, if you would um, like to take the floor to talk to us a little bit about the challenges and opportunities that you see for Reliance moving forward in the region of, of Latin America as you have um, been working on the uh, Fee Pharma Reliance uh, group and your uh, I guess the, the the best person in the group, the group to talk up to us about this. Thank you very much, Sergio, for this opportunity, and thank you for joining us, and thank you, Fifarma. Well, this is a very interesting question, since uh, I think Latin America has many opportunities, and some of them were mentioned by by our colleagues, by Ludovico, and also by by Jorge. Uh, I think. Uh, we should participate in more collaborative efforts. We have experience in the region, but there's still a, a lot of opportunities. Uh, also, we need to, to be more uh, present in harmonization and convergence efforts. There's a lot to do, and I think uh, we have been very su successful. For example, in Central America, we have a nice example. So this really works. Another important ingredient is trust trust among regulators and the regulated industry. Uh, I think the implementation of good regulatory practices is key since transparency is one of the items from good regulatory practices and this always goes together with good reliance practices. Uh, I think uh, we see more and more participation from Latin American countries in different international efforts, but there's still a lot to do. And another uh, item that I would like to bring to the discussion is why not we should think about collaboration with regulators from different regions, maybe like-minded uh, authorities, authorities with similar capacities. We should also consider and not just think about working with Latin American agencies. Sometimes we find more similarities in other uh, regions. Thanks, Maria. No, these are very relevant. Uh, points. Muchas gracias, Maria. Todos puntos muy relevantes. To continue this discussion also within Creo que nos encantaría seguir en esta discusión con AFPMA para seguir abordando estos desafíos para la región. Pasando a Ludovico. Muchas gracias por tu presentación, Ludovico. Creo que fue una muy buena demostración de lo que podemos llamar regulación inteligente del lado de Swiss Medic porque realmente muestra un uso proactivo e intencional de muchas de las herramientas que están disponibles para los reguladores al momento de tomar decisiones con base en evaluaciones de riesgo previas. Reliance as a reference agency, but also as a reliance agency and which really demonstrates that Reliance is uh, an exemplar of uh, regulatory uh, capacity and, and excellence. Um, there were a lot of questions in the chat and uh, by, by the participants with regards to the uh, MAGHP and also the Access Consortium. But I guess maybe I would ask you from, from Swiss Medics participation in Access, um, are there any main lessons learned that you would like to, to share with us uh, from Swiss Medic participation in this? And is there any opportunity perhaps for other regions to, to get involved like uh, Latin America? Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergio. And I've tried to uh, start at least answering some of the questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I will do uh, so more and more uh, during the, the time uh, during the panel, uh, but to with regard to your question uh, in terms of lessons learned from the Access Consortium, so um, yes, we we think we came to the conclusion that um, it is a really attractive piece of work for us for different reasons. Uh, for once, uh, I'll start with the benefits that we see for the for the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, we we expect. Uh, for them to recognize an increased, uh, to, to be able to reach an increased demand through the Access Consortium, they will be able to, to reach simultaneously or, the, or almost simultaneously uh, a, 
different regions uh, with a quite huge uh, population. I think all the access um, authorities together have a population of uh, around 150 uh, million. So it's, it's um, I think, yeah, we could be considered one of the uh, great players uh, after EMA and, and, and US uh, FDA uh, or one of the reference uh, authorities with the, with the biggest uh, population. So I think it's it's a, for sure also an attractive um, procedure for, for the industry and for uh, the authorities that are involved. This means mainly a really um, a great cut in resources because we have to allocate for only one part of the assessment report. Uh, we have to release resources for one part of that. So it's a huge um, um, saving in terms of, of resources. But we also share a lot of expertise because we've seen that um, we can also leverage on the different um, expertise that is within each of the agencies. And we do also allocate based on that. So we know that maybe one agency is uh, particularly um, exp uh, as a particular expertise on a specific field. So um, they, they are tasked to do that part and the other agencies can can learn also from that, can, can expand their capacities and, and learn from, from each other. Um, and yeah, I think that's, um, that's in a nutshell what we've learned so far. We've learned to, uh, to, to be mindful of our resources, to avoid duplications. And not only avoid regulations, but to leverage on what each of us has to offer and to, um, yeah, and really uh, make use of that. And you've also mentioned regarding expanding or get, uh, getting the region, the Latin American region involved. So um, I think for the moment, the Access Consortium uh, is not actively looking to expand the, the membership. Uh, um, I hope I do not uh, say anything too um, uh, too risky. Uh, but with the new ac acquisition of uh, of MRH, uh, MHRA, we've um, or the Access Consortium had to take some time to absorb this new expertise, this new um, colleague on board. So uh, we are still adjusting to that setting. So for the moment being, uh, we are. Um, I think, uh, yeah, not looking to expand the, the, um, the membership. Yeah, no, thanks for the answer, Ludovico. And, and I think that makes sense uh, given the, the context of, of the webinar and the participants, I thought it would be interesting to hear yeah. your perspective on this, but uh, I guess my hope would be with the WHO uh, efforts on the GBT and really making sure that all countries are on board with some of these uh, collaboration uh, activities, perhaps, initiatives like access but also others uh, would be easier for other for members to join and collaborate uh, with the support of this uh, GBT procedure from from the, the WHO. Uh, so moving to Jorge and maybe just before that because I acknowledge that there are many questions in the chat about the IFPMA template for uh, describing product uh, characteristics uh, and differences. Um, I would invite anyone who is interested in discussing the technicalities or the technical aspects of how this template can be used to please reach out to us at IFPMA. You have my email on, on the IFPMA website. Uh, we are more than happy to facilitate a bilateral discussion with our experts who put this template together because we don't have too much time and we're actually already behind schedule. But um, we are more than happy to have a bilateral discussion with some of you on how this can be used. And with that, I would ask uh, Jorge uh, if you would like to talk to us a little bit about some of the examples of product characteristics that can be considered um, in this context of product sameness and in the use of this uh, IFPMA template. Yeah, Th thanks, Sergio. This is a, a, an interesting question. I, I think you know, because our region has, for example, different zone, zone climatic zone that we need to consider, uh, an area where we have some differences is the stability, for example. Uh, I think, you know, if we provide a proper uh, justification, of course, with the data that is needed in line with 
what is established in, in the authority that will review the dossier and, and in compliance with the zone four conditions, we still are keeping the quality, the same quality as, as the product is, let's say, manufactured in Europe. And, and I think there are these, these mechanisms, you know, where we can show in the template, for example, that you mentioned, what are those differences and confirm that there is no chance change in the quality of the product. Thanks so much, Jorge. So we're already behind schedule and uh, I'm sorry for everyone, we're not being able to, to answer all the questions immediately. But again, I reiterate what I said, please reach out to us uh, at IFPMA. We are more than happy to, to continue this discussion uh, with some of you uh, and involve our experts uh, in, in this fora as well. Uh, Diego, maybe I hand it over to, to you before we wrap up the, the webinar. Yeah. Muchas gracias, Sergio. Thank you very much. Y agradecemos a todos los asistentes eh, por su valiosa participación. Thank you so much to all our attendees for your valuable participation. And of course, thank you to IFPMA. Thank you to the whole work team. I want to invite you to follow uh, FIFARMA and IFPMA in uh, websites where you'll be able to find some valuable material on Reliance. IFARMA and IFPMA share a strong commitment to the strengthening of regulatory systems, and we are fully committed to support regulatory agencies to adopting approaches that allow them to meet their public health objectives more efficiently, such as reliance mechanisms. I also want to make to use this opportunity to invite you to join us next uh, Thursday, May the 23rd, to a second session that will be organized together with the European Federation, where we'll be focusing on reliance for post-registration changes and which link for access will be available in the coming days. The same goes for the recordings of these sessions, which will be available in the YouTube channel for FIFARMA and on our website. Thank you very much once again for your participation. Sergio, you have the floor for our final message today. Thank you so much, Diego. So I think for my concluding remarks, I'll just uh, use a, a concept that uh, Ludovico alluded to in, in his presentation, which is that we know that no regulatory authority can be present everywhere at the same time and doing everything at once, right? And uh, it's it's really this the 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 idea behind all this collaborative activities that uh, we as industry are also trying to actively um make make happen and make sure that we have uh, reliance procedures in place that are suitable for applicants for uh, the nras but ultimately that also serve patients so that they can get their products uh, timely so with that i'll just once again invite everyone to get in touch uh, with us at ifpma to know more about the resources that we have in place and Thank again all the panelists that uh, had the time to discuss with us today, and also FIFARMA for uh, working with IFPMA on setting up this uh, great initiative. And with that, I'll close today's session and hope to see everyone in the second edition of this webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Have a good Thank day. You. Have a good Bye -bye. rest. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye everyone.